sit there and then I'll say, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself, Dave? All right. Welcome to the I'm a Practicing Musician podcast, where we explore what it means to be a practicing musician from perspective spanning music educators to famous musicians. I'm your host, Jake Douglas, and our guest today is practicing musicians, WordPress manager, Dave Kabrik. In addition to being one of the tech wizards running our platform, Dave has enjoyed practicing trumpet for most of his life and loves artists such as Herb Alpert, and other jazz musicians. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Dave? Thanks for being here, first of all, but I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your interests in, in music in particular. Well, thank you for inviting me. I uh, I loved music from a little kid. I was a, a, was in a family and uh, I picked up the trumpet when I was a little kid and started playing it and got lessons and played all the way up through uh, high school and somewhat into college and I, I just love grabbing the instrument and just making more music, just just do it for myself. I don't need to have people out in front of me. And, uh, you know, like say, Herb Albert, T1 and Brass was the first album, first trumpeter I heard. Uh, it was my brother's uh, album. And uh, I thought that was so cool, that sound of that trumpet. You know? And it just it just hit my ears, and from then on I was hooked. Uh, I love uh, Maynard Ferguson and uh, Arterio uh, Sandoval. I can't pronounce his last name. Everybody knows him, and uh, you know Al Hurt and Dizzy Gillespie and and Louis Armstrong. Uh, Chuck Mangione changed my life. Uh, he got me to buy a fluga horn. <laughs> And uh, an interesting story about that flugelhorn. I bought it. Uh, I was probably 16 at the time, and uh, I was I was in the, I was getting lessons from uh, our band instructor Dave Aaron. He used to play for the big bands and in, in jazz bands and stuff. And uh, I told him I wanted a flugelhorn. He goes, "Let me find you one." And uh, he goes, "Olds may have one left." I said, how much is it? He goes, five, six hundred bucks. I can't remember. It was a lot of money back then in the 70s. And I said, well, I've saved up this much. Here's how much I got. See if you can find me one. And he, uh, about a month later, I get this uh, old flugelhorn for it to be the last one that was in the warehouse, supposedly. And uh, I started playing it. Loved it. Uh, a lot of people say that a trumpet is your wife. Your flugelhorn is your mistress. Well, I wore my mistress out. Uh, yeah. It, 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 I wore the valves out and I played it so much. And I was working, I had a shop in Sela, and uh, this guy from England came over and moved into Sela, and he was a trumpet player for the Queen. And he was making trumpets. And he came into my shop one day. I listened to him play a few times at a few of the concerts in town. And uh, came in the shop and we got talking. I said, oh, you're the guy, that, you're the trumpeter. And uh, he started talking about this. And I said, well, I've got a flugelhorn here. And uh, I think it's getting wore out. He grabbed it and he played a little bit on it. He goes, yeah, the valves are wore out. And he goes, let me see if I can make, if I can fix that. He comes back and goes, I can't find any valves for it. I'd have to take the whole casing out and put a new thing. And I didn't have the money to do it. And then he turned around and said, I love the design on it. I, I, got a, I got a person that wants a custom-made flugelhorn. So I gave him the flugelhorn to use, and he brought it back to me, and he goes, you want to sell it? And I said, well, it's no, I can't afford to fix it. <laughs> so I ended up selling it to him, and uh, hmm. I lost my mistress. Then. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I guess that's what happens with mistresses. They go where the money is, huh? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Oh boy, well that's a that's a good story. So you uh my jazz teacher, well, I was in a jazz improv class at Harvey Mudd when I was going to the Claremont Colleges, and he was exclusively a flugelhorn player. And uh fantastic computer science. I mean, uh, Harvey Mudd is kind of like MIT. It's MIT and then Harvey Mudd is the next math and science uh school. 
and they just had a jazz improv class because this guy loved jazz. He created a program called Improviser. His name was Robert Keller. I actually saw him at NAMM in January of 2020. That was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, that was the first introduction that I had to flugelhorn and it sounded cool. They're kind of like a smaller, but also like just a weirdly shaped trumpet, but almost identical. Uh the the bell's bigger, right? But then the actual yeah, it's, it's a bigger bell, a little taller, uh -huh. you know, this way, a little shorter this way, and uh, they got a really mellow sound to them. Mm, yeah, and it's just that nice mellow sound. It's not a, you know, like a trumpet. You know, trumpets are like, boom! I'm out there. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can't miss a trumpet, no. That's for sure. So, so jazz is your primary uh, preference, I guess, for music. Yeah, I love, I love, I love jazz. I love small band jazz. Small band yeah. jazz. Okay, so yeah, two or three trumpets, a couple, couple saxophones, uh, set of drums. Uh, you know, got piano. That's fine. Got to have the bass guitar. You know, the walking bass. Very uh, nice. <laughs> Yeah, I love the walking bass. Our upright bass teacher was uh, the, he toured with the uh, National Park Centennial Jazz Band for a while. He's in a bunch of jazz groups around here. And he's, I actually just saw a post from him on Facebook this morning. He's moving out to New York City to continue working with Paula Boggs, Big Band, and a few other groups. But he's also into hip hop and funk and whatnot. That walking bass line is so cool. I love it. So in your opinion, what, what do you think, uh, being a practicing musician for as long as you have been, what do you think that term means? What does it mean to be a practicing musician? Well, I, I don't know. I, you know, a lot of people say, well, well, you got to practice to, you know, be good at your craft, mm -hmm. which would be, you know, I was a trumpet player and, uh, but I practice because I love the sound and it's emotional for me. Mm -hmm. uh, for me to be a practicing musician, I would grab it because I felt a little blue and I wanted to play something to get that out of me. Or I was happy, I wanted to grab it and just play. You know, I I just love grab grabbing my instrument and just playing. And, yeah. You know, I did a lot of studying and a lot of you know, I would grab, buy books and, you know, learn how to play different songs and different, different melodies. And, you know, of course, I played in the orchestra band and I played in the concert band and I played in the stage band. And, uh, you know, that's great stuff. It gets your mind going back and forth and it gets your senses going. It just kind of wakens you up. Mm -hmm. But, uh, be a practicing musician, I think, I, I don't know, it's just part of my life. Just practice playing my instrument has been part of my life all my life because it's kind of like something safe I can just go to and just play. Yeah. Just do it. And enjoy it. Yeah, a way to authentically express yourself. Yes. Yeah, that's that's largely how I view it as well. I, I enjoy, I thoroughly enjoy performing for people. And I haven't done that in, well, I was going to some improv nights Mondays at the Nectar Lounge at, called Mojam Mondays. Phenomenal setup that has been going on for, I guess, 11 years as of December, every Monday. It's it's amazing. But I haven't even done that in a year and a half. And I haven't performed with a group since before the pandemic. But I still play my drum set every night. <laughs> One to two hours every night. And it's just, it keeps me grounded and I get to process everything that I've done through the day while simultaneously working towards some new skill set and seeing a little bit of personal evolution each time I sit down at the kit. So it's, uh, it's wonderful. I think it's also taught me how to connect with people a bit better than I would have, uh, would know how to do without playing music. Do you, have you had any experience like that? Well, I think music is is a connecting force. It's a it's an art form that everybody can relate to one way or the other. You know, maybe emotional, maybe uh, something tied into what what uh, is going on in their life. 
you know, my music, you know, I, I, I love jazz music. I love the blues. Uh, I like classical music. I like all kinds of music. But a lot of it has to do with where I'm sitting at at that point in time in life. Hmm. <clears throat> and I think people connect connect the music depending on what they're like. You know, when I was 16 and love and stuff, there's a lot of love songs and a lot of love and stuff. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, and it uh, may have bad mood. It's a lot of, a lot of bad, you know, mellow stuff, blues stuff. You know, sometimes it's just kind of like, you know, you listen to a little Albert King. And, uh, yeah. Blues or, uh, uh, Johnny Lee Hooker, one of my favorite guys to listen to. Robert mm -hmm. Craig. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of metal and blues, I just saw Aristocrats uh, for the first time. Couple, it was right after Valentine's Day. And they're like an amalgamation of every genre, but they do a lot of blues and jazz and then metal in there. And uh -huh. it was phenomenal. It was... Uh, it was amazing. But what I'm hearing you say and uh, what I experience, a lot of people I talk to experience, is that music, in a way, is getting at the, whether we're listening to it or playing it, when we're playing it, we're obviously expressing the emotion that we're feeling right then. But really good music is expressing something that is universally experienced. And so that's why we can connect to it. Is that that what you're uh, like a good way of summing up what you just said? Yeah, I think that's exactly. It's uh, it's a art form that that uh, we we can all connect to one way or the other, and so you know it's around the world. Yeah, uh, there's all different types of music. You know, you got the drums, you got the you know the African music, and uh, uh, well, I was married to a uh, uh, Iraq person for a while and yeah uh, you know the belly dance music the, uh it's all it's all it's all relatable you know mm -hmm. tell stories language. yeah well and why do you think that it, it it I guess maybe the first question would be do you think that music has the ability to connect people on that emotional level where uh almost at, at a deeper emotional level than other art forms or other disciplines. I think so. Yeah, that, that's a lot of musicians say that. So my question then would be, why do you think that is? Rhythm, rhythm of life, you know? We all have rhythm in us. We all have, uh, you know, we have a heartbeat. We have, you know, it just pumps through us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's the living soul it just pumps and it just goes it's just uh it's who we are mm -hmm. you know, like it's in our dna yeah yeah i go back sometimes to even like existential philosophy when they're like i was sitting there and then sartre's like i was looking at my hand and i was like what is this thing and when i'm walking down the street you know and i hear some birds or i hear like even a car go by me what i'm hearing is i'm hearing this rhythm and it gets a little bit louder crescendos as the car's coming towards me. And then it decrescendos as it goes away. And then the birds, you can hear them talking to each other. And there is a rhythm in how they're talking. And when you're watching a movie, most people are like, oh, they're they're talking. But there is a very specific cadence with phrasing to the words. Everything that we say has this rhythm. It's just in, it's in everything that we experience. And so... Yeah, that's what's so interesting to me. Oh yeah, I was, I was thinking. I was thinking you're talking about the cars going through and stuff. I remember when I uh, at one point in time I was I, I worked in manufacturing, and I could go out and I could hear each of those machines had their rhythm, had their had their own music that they played when they <laughs> yeah. went through, and I uh -huh. knew I could tell by the rhythm which they were playing if they're on or off. There's something wrong with that machine, or there wasn't because of the sound that was coming out of it. It's just that there, everything was in rhythm. Yep. Oh, well, totally. It's funny. I was laughing because I was dating a girl back in 2019 to 2020, and uh, she, <laughs> we, she got in my car, and uh, 
she like didn't want to wear her seatbelt in the front. And so my uh, my dashboard was making this noise because it's telling you to put your seatbelt on. And she's like, I don't want to put my seatbelt on. When is that like, but is that going to keep going off? I was like, no, no, no. It only has 23 uh, beeps left. She's like, what do you mean? I was like, 22, 21. And then it stopped. She's like, how did you know that? I was like, because I count everything. <laughs> like, I'm feeling the rhythm. I know that there's there's 10 beeps that are loud, uh, like beep, beep, beep. And then it goes beep, 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 beep for 40 more times. I just know because there's a rhythm and everything is programmed mathematically from a human perspective. That's how programming works. And so mm -hmm. there has to be some, some cadence. It, it's not going to change. That's not how things uh, in the tech world work. So yeah. yeah, it's funny that you're saying that. I think my dad, I've never been into mechanics at all myself. Uh, in fact, that was kind of a point of contention between me and my dad is he always wanted me to get in there and fix cars and, you know, do manly man stuff. And I was like, I'd rather use my brain. But, uh, and uh, I just, I mostly I hate getting dirty. <laughs> so, but, uh, but he can, when he's in a car, he's like, oh, so this is wrong with it. He just knows. And it's got to be because of the sound. I don't know. Yeah, because the, the sound it's making, the sound, you're used to the sound that's always from a certain thing. Just like, you know, I get, I, I know what my wife's, sound, my wife's voice sounds like. Yeah. We're, we're, we're tuned into different sounds around us all the time. Hmm. You know, we're sitting here and it's like, oh, that's this going on. Oh, that's this going on. That's going on. And I think we do it subconsciously. We just pick up sounds all around. And I think yeah. that's where music ties in so well with everybody because they don't realize how much sound is around them all the time that's coming in. Yeah. Well, there's a couple things on that. First, do you think that that's how mothers are so in tune with their babies? not even necessarily conscious it's just that there's some connection to these rhythms and something something's off or this cry means this thing and the, like yeah. us as men we're like i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh what was the other thing that that made me think of though um oh boy it was good. Well, I keep on looking at your shirt and the duck is just like staring at me. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> He's wearing a raincoat. <laughs> no, this this band is great. It's uh, another interesting way of using rhythms. Uh, and I posted this in the water cooler chat before I went to see it. But they played that song where they pull out a rubber chicken and a rubber pig and they're mm -hmm. like playing and then they start doing wink wink <laughs> and then they're they're making different like wink <laughs> and then they're playing off of each other trying to match the rhythms between these uh fake animals it was great so yeah i think rhythm can be everywhere um that's where i was going to go so before you became a wordpress manager you were working in a shop somewhere right can you tell me a little bit about that uh my generator shop <laughs> the what the generator shop or which shop I've, well, I've done we, things over my years a lot well you were just talking about uh mechanics of cars and i think what you said yeah. is you got into wordpress because you were working somewhere and you had to create a website for them oh, yeah i bought a uh i got involved in a uh small engine shop and mm. uh I knew that the I knew the internet was coming. I knew it was there. That's uh, I, and I knew that the business in town would not suffice for what I needed. So I I started looking at, at the internet and uh, web design. So I decided we needed to build a e-commerce site, and uh, so I did all the studying on e-commerce and stuff, and and built the first website for called small engine shop mm -hmm. that was a uh, e-commerce site and back in 2000 and boy that had been 2002 2003 and yeah. uh, 
it was pretty successful. It's really good. I, I learned how to, uh, uh, it's really funny because I needed to get it SEO'd and I didn't know much about SEO. And of course the internet wasn't really big at that point in time mm -hmm. for information. So I hired a firm out of, uh, Seattle, out of Redmond and, mm -hmm. uh, they're supposed to be really good. And when I was there running the big, big ass check and it's like, They just wanted me to send them money. I said, no, I want to, I want to know how you're doing this. So I went over there and they gave us a full view of what they're doing and stuff. And they turned around and said, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to call. You can ask all the questions you want. So I started watching it and it's like, okay, how are they doing this? So I'd, I'd be on the phone with them two, three times a week, asking questions, how they're doing stuff. And I was so fascinated on the methods of getting a website up on top. Mm -hmm. And so after about a year or so, paying them the monthly fee, I canceled it and I started doing the SEOing. And I had so much fun because it's like I take a page that was at the bottom and I'm having all this big competition up there. And I would go in there and SEO it and do, do what. I was supposed to do to it, make it better, make it, make it more plausible questions and what people want it and this, that and everything. And I was getting my pages above pages that were out there for a long time up on top. And, right. like, you know, that's, and, and, and you know, that, that's kind of like the trumpet player in me, you know, it's like, I'm a, I'm an introvert. Mm -hmm. and you get trumpet in front of me and the stage in front of me, it's like, I'm going to be heard. Yeah. Be out front. Yeah. And uh, that's the same thing with SEO. I sit there and I say, okay, who's up there? Mm -hmm. I'm going to, no, I'm going to be, we're going to be louder. We're going to be better. We're going to be on top. Yeah. No, I think that's key. And, and something I'm hearing from what, from that story is that, which a lot of people don't do. And it would be, I think society would be a lot better place if more people did this, but you saw something that was interesting to you. And instead of just having somebody else do it, you went and asked them a lot of questions about how to do it. That's what music has really taught me is music is such a community oriented uh, activity that, I mean, most of the time I'm playing with people 10, 20, 30 years older than me, and they have way more experience and they see, they wouldn't be playing with me if they didn't see something in me or whatnot. But part of that, what I've come to realize what they see in me is that I ask them questions. I ask, so I'm, I'm trying to learn from them and I'm open to that. And that's really turning my whole life into a musical journey because now it's paying attention to, you know, don't know how like woo woo we want to get into it, but like it's paying attention to the harmony and, and trying to make, my own world more home harmonious in a greater number of situations. And, uh, and so that's amazing that you did it. Do you think that, uh, playing it's well, you just, I said it to a degree, but do you think that playing music and playing trumpet taught you that skill set? Well, yeah, because I, I, I had to ask a lot of questions to learn how to play. <laughs> I, yeah. was not a, I was not a natural born player. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a uh, everything I did in music. I had I had big big struggle. Uh, you take a look at like my daughter. She plays. She started out playing trumpet, then played the trombone, plays the played the violin. Now she has a cello. And she loves playing the cello. She she can take pick up an instrument and just it's like it becomes part of her. Mm -hmm. Me, I pick up an instrument. I've got to go. Okay, how do you play this? How do you hold your lips? How do you do this? How do you do that? How do you do this? Do, 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 do. And that's the way my whole struggle for playing trumpet was. Mm -hmm. Only way I can excel is by playing a lot. Practicing mm. a lot. And asking, <clears throat> asking, hey, how do you do that? That uh, How do you get up to those super high notes? Because every trumpet player wants to know how to do that. Yeah. You know, and how do you stay up there without killing your lips or your armature? You know? Yeah. And there's ways to do it. But when, once you start asking questions, it's like life. 
how do you do life? But if you start asking a question, if you think you know it all, <laughs> you're never going to grow. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. You know, it's uh, contempt before investigation. I guess it's called prejudice. You know, we're prejudiced about so many things in life because we think it's like, like you say, it's set in our mind to know something. And we just don't want to ask any questions about it. Mm -hmm. If we start asking questions and listening and learning, we get we get to be wiser and smarter over the time. If we don't ask questions, we might as well just die. Yeah. Well, and in, in music, I found more so than in other communities, people are willing to answer the questions honestly. Mm -hmm. A lot of other places, like what we were dealing with with GoDaddy yesterday, that was crazy because we're we they switched the dns the way that our domain points to our website so our website went down they did it without our permission i called them and they said well it wasn't us because we need your permission to do this and i'm like so you're telling me that i did this and she's like well let me go talk to my manager and the manager's like yes we're telling you that we couldn't have done this because we didn't have your permission i'm like <laughs> i guarantee i didn't do this and so in the business world, though, the whole point, uh, at least in some companies, is to maximize profit. And in maximizing profit, you have to make concessions in uh, creating harmony and admitting when things are not uh, done the way that they should have been done. And uh, and that that's unfortunate. So that's what I find about the not not that you should be around people to use them and just get as much information as possible, but that that you you should also share i mean this is part of the harmony is also like i don't mind talking with anybody and sharing any information that they ask for because i strongly believe that well i'll just i'll just i guess lay it out a little bit i strongly believe that if, if we have free will which we do the only way to truly have free will because will implies that we meant to do something so if we don't understand that we are causing some effect, then we didn't will it. And so if we don't, if we aren't educated, then we are just ignorant and we're causing all of these uh, effects without understanding that we're causing them. So education, that's why I got into education and that's why I'm doing Practicing Musician and all of the Open Learn X and a bunch of other projects that I've got going on because Man, there's we we don't teach common sense. We don't teach these things in school, and uh, we're teaching people how to fit into this machine that a lot of the times doesn't uh, isn't conducive to growth of the individual. But music, I've almost never met a person in the music community that has like is like keeping their information to themselves. That's what I love about it. Yeah. And yeah. I love I love the way the platform is set up too. You know, it's the uh, you know when you asked me when I was originally asked to come on board or say hey what do you think about this and I looked at it and I went through the lessons and it just blew my mind. It's like this is so cool. <laughs> little, little, little short blurbs on how to do this and this that and everything. The videos there. It's just like boom. It's just like these guys are on something. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, there's a, uh, in the coming iterations, it's going to be even better because it'll be, well, I, I think I can say this essentially like a video wiki. And then the micro tutoring helps a lot too. But you, you, did you watch uh, Jim Cisco do a lot of the trumpet lessons? I did. Yeah. He's phenomenal, huh? He's very good. Yeah. It's very, yeah. Precise, very, very uh, technique oriented. And it's, uh, yeah, it is, it is like, boy, all you have to, people can do this. And they yeah. can learn, they can learn to play music. And once you learn to play music, it's with you for your whole life. Yeah. You view, you view everything differently too, not just the music. Yeah, you view the, uh, you know, you play music, you understand <clears throat> the artist more. You understand what they go through. Mm -hmm. People listen to music and it's like, oh, this is a great tune, this is a great tune, this is a great tune. But when you start listening to, you know, and you performed and you know what the emotions are going into that music and 
and playing, you have a different appreciation for it, I guess. Totally. Well, and, and one of the things that you said earlier is exactly why we set it up the way that we set it up, which is there is, I don't know if it's a stigma or a mindset that I can only play music if I have natural talent or if I want to like do it as a career or want to become famous, right? And this happened in my family. My family even said it's not a good career option. My family are all doctors. They said, we don't want you to go to school for music because you're not going to make good enough money, essentially, from doing that. And I was like, okay. So I went to college uh, at Pitzer because they had a pre-med doctorate of osteopathy program. And that was what my family said. It was very like the Asian kind of Indian, like you're going to do doctor, engineer, or lawyer. <laughs> you know, it's like that kind of thing. And, uh, but I met... I met uh, amazing musicians very first day and I just didn't look back. But the um, the point I'm making here is, where was I going with that? Ah, I lost my train of thought twice. <laughs> uh, you, don't have, you, don't, you don't have to play it, but you don't have to have natural talent. You don't have to uh, do it as a career. You don't have to do any as uh yeah. Any, uh, I got to go make money. I got to be a star. I got to be this or I got to be that. You do it because it's uh, something you enjoy doing. And once you learn, learn it and you get it, you enjoy doing it. Well, totally. And, and, and being able to learn is a sequential process. Mm -hmm. we know, we've developed instrumental pedagogy over thousands of years. We know the right sequence in which to teach people. You have to learn how to hold an instrument before you learn how to make a sound instrument, before you learn how to make a specific pitch, before you, and then how you do a riff. Like there's, there's, and you want to be able to hear things before you play it so that then you make sure that what you're, the right tune, like you're in tune because you can actually hear what it should sound like. There's, uh, that's called audiation. There's very specific ways of teaching. And so when people, don't go through that process then they feel like they can't that they don't have any talent natural talent they're never going to be famous because they're missing some information that they're trying to build upon and if you build a house and the inspector says oh this is a the foundation is 80 percent done go ahead and build the second story the house is just going to fall over <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's good. You know, that... I, uh, I I get I get the, I get the I get at Proxy Musician. I, I do a lot of different things. I, I I you know work on the website and make sure it runs and and make sure things run smooth. And I get to, I get to post the blogs. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you this last blog was so good. I loved it. Unlocking young minds: the cognitive benefits of classical lessons. Yeah. Classical lessons. And I read through that. It's like, wow, that is so true. You know, you, when you when you take music lessons, you learn you learn the the listening, the audio, the uh, rhythm. You learn counting. You learn everything. And your focus and attention and discipline. It's, it, there's such a great article on that. Yeah, well, and I read that last night too. It's it's very impressive. The thing about, and that's one of the reasons why music is so good, but it's also one of the reasons why it's so complicated. It's because that's a lot for the brain to process simultaneously. I need to count and be aware of my spatial, like have spatial awareness and power this in, the sound in this instrument. And I need to make sure that it's in tune, which is also math because that's frequency. And then I need to play in, in time, like, and I need to, it, it's, and then I need to play with other people that are doing that too. Like, and they have to, we, we have to be in sync, like, and, uh, yeah. and then I have to be cognizant. It's essentially like a language too. So you're engaging Broca and Wernicke's because you're doing language production and comprehension at the same time, because you're listening to what the other it's, it's massively complex. And so this is why people feel like they can't engage because they don't, 
that you need to take it in these small chunks, build one thing on top of the other. And eventually you get to that place where it is just second nature. So actually, this is a great question I ask a lot. That is the primary transition between craft building phase to being an artist. And they're always present. I mean, even after an artist, you're still building your craft. But what to you do you see as the difference between the craft building and the actually being a, a musician or being a, a, being able to do your art as you want it to be done? Well, what's funny is you, you talked about... <laughs> You talked about, you know, having to keep time and this, that, and everything. I remember when I first started out, I remember, you know, Dave, you got to tap your foot to keep the beat and you got to do this and you got to do that. And I remember I was so clumsy. It, it just, I mean, it was so frustrating, so hard, but that's building your craft. Yeah. You know, it, is learning to do that stuff, learning, learning how to keep the beat, learning how to listen to the other musicians and know what they're playing and know the rhythm and, be able to play in that rhythm, especially if you don't get notes. <laughs> you know, you get music, sheet music in front of you, you're expected to pull out, and start playing. Uh, yeah, that's that's building your craft. The art about it is to be able to play with those musicians and feel what they're trying to put through as an emotion or as a play. And be able to play with their emotions as you play. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that you're not just playing notes. You're you're expressing what you're doing. Yeah. And uh, I think I, I always look at a great artist who loved to express what he's doing. He was a guitar player, Santana. Oh yeah, he's wonderful. He 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 could he could. He can express those notes, and when he hit those notes, he, he he had a reason why he hit the high note just like that. And then there's reasons why he just laid it down, and he just brought his full emotion through his guitar. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what that's what the art that's what that's the art part of it. Mm -hmm. just the crafting is learning how to do that, learning how to put your emotions through it, and learning how to do that. I that's my my reasoning between craft and art. Yeah, and for people listening at home, really what the the difference is hitting that one note very specifically. I could play it really loud. I could play it really soft. I could play it in the middle. I could play any spectrum of volume. Then I can play any length. Then I can play any kind of yeah. vibrato. So do or flat or I could play it uh, like crescendo, decrescendo. There's so many different ways and Every single note can be like that. Yep. Every single note can be like that. And that's why you have to learn how to do all of those things individually. That's the craft building phase. And then putting that into the sequence of the rest of the song, that's what makes you stand out from everybody else. That's what makes diff, uh, the a piece by Beethoven be able to be interpreted a hundred different ways. Because the notes on the page are not the music. It's the interpretation, that expression that's put into it. Yeah, I had a, uh, I had a great, I got to tell you a story. I was a yeah. junior in high school, and I played I played second trumpet most of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we played, the second trumpet played a lot of solos. We mm -hmm. went down to Spain, we went down to stage band competition down in Oregon at one of the universities, and we were invited down to play. And... You know, we've got all these stage bands playing and this, that, and the other thing. And they wouldn't let us really listen to the other bands until we played. Mm -hmm. And so they throw the sheet music that we've never seen before in front of us. And says, okay, we want you guys to play it. So I kind of look through it and I'm, I'm opening, I open it up and there's a page here of notes. You know, the first, I don't know, 10 bars of music. And then it's all chords for the next five pages. And then there's a bunch of notes again. It's like, oh my gosh, I got I got a I got a solo here. I don't even know what's going on. So it come turns out that we played the whole band played for like 10, 10 bars, 15 bars. Yeah. The drum quit, everything quit, 
and I was the only one playing with no notes. So I started pulling that. So I just started playing a little bit here, you know. Just try, I tried to play the rhythm and stuff. I was just all, you know, I got judges up in front of me. And I, I get through the first two or three pages. And then then Mark, Mark Aaron, the son of the director, was first trumpet. And he stepped in and played for, I don't know, a page or so. And then I stepped back up, played for a page or so. And then, then at the end, we the whole band played for another 10, 10 notes and was done. And that yep. was a competition. You ought to see our band director light off on those judges. And it's like, how the heck do you judge a whole band when the when 99% of the thing is one solo for one trumpet player? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I was, I was sweating bullets when I saw that. It's like, you know, I, I could play, a, you know, a minute solo, two minutes, maybe a minute and a half solo. Like yeah. Five pages of it. That's a very long solo. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, it just blew my mind. I also said, I am not going to be able to be a professional trumpet player because of that. It really cut me down. It really? Out. Yeah. It was just like, if this is what they expect at college level to play that long of a solo, it's like, oh, I'm just not, not going to be able to make it. No, almost never. That doesn't, that that's a very long solo, but yeah, I mean, that, that brings up another good point, which is a lot of times in the school system, we learn how to read music, mm -hmm. but not how to improvise. And that improvisation is really a component of what's actually happening inside at that moment. It's a different different type of expression. And, um, you know, I've got funny stories about, I got a funny story I can share with you right now about that because I grew up playing classical flute through the Suzuki method, four to age 15, went into saxophone uh, because I was much more proficient at my instrument at flute by the time the elementary school concert band started. So I needed to play a different instrument, then took piano lessons, then got on a drum kit and drum kit. I never took lessons. So I almost exclusively play by ear. I can read music now, but um fast forward till it was 2015 this is actually the last day that i drank or smoked weed and smoked cigarettes this is the last time day i did anything like that i was um i was at a bar dive bar playing music and this guy came in and i knew all the bartenders i went to school with all of them and they said uh, he was asking for somebody who plays woodwinds. And they're like, oh, well, this guy plays flute. He's up there playing drums when he plays flute. So he came over and asked me if I'd play a show with them at this uh, casino that was closing down. I was like, okay. And it turns out that they're all like Motown session musicians. Literally, we're in the Motown scene. Like they're in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and they're just phenomenal musicians and i'm some white dude playing flute <laughs> like there's not very much flute on motown but they that's what they wanted me to do so i was like okay so i practiced with them twice i learned two and a half hours worth of material and i was like good i'm ready to play this show we get there and they started changing the keys and i am classically trained so i can play based off of music uh -huh. And I cannot transpose from one key to the next. <laughs> so for two and a half hours, they're playing. And I'm just like, is this the right note? Like, is it, am I in the right? Like, <laughs> I'm just trying to figure it out. And then they had me take some solos. And I'm like, toot, uh, toot. <laughs> the worst performance I've ever done. And then afterwards, they're like, yeah, good job. I was like, well, you didn't tell me we were going to play. I practiced in the keys that we were practicing in. And uh but that was the day I was like, okay, there's much more to this music thing than I even knew. And so I was like, I, I got to get, I, I'm, I'm ready to, to stop drinking and smoking and take this very, very seriously and learn how to do all this stuff. Because it's a completely different area of the brain to sight read than it is to like read music, than it is to improvise, than it is to create your own music. Um, have you done much composition? Probably not. Probably not. So <laughs> you, when you were playing, you were primarily playing other people's music? Uh, yes. But when I played by myself, I made my own music up. Nice. <laughs> so that was that was more improvisational? 
you know. Yeah. And, uh, with I studied when I studied with uh, Dave Aaron those few years, that's what we that's what we played. He was a jazz band player, so it was mostly improbably improv jazz. Yeah. So we'd flip something on after a while. We'd flip something on. We'd both play, and without music. Mm -hmm. Well, I, we, well, an improvisational jazz is almost once you learn how to do it because that's what I did in in college at Harvey Mudd. It's to a degree formulaic because you have 16, 8, 32 bars, whatever it might be. And then you have the the chord progression that you're soloing over. But it's not just completely free form, although some just jazz does sound like that. But you know, and talk a little bit about how you how you can know what to play within the context of what the other musicians are playing. And, and that's what it is. It's, it's like what, what kind of rhythm, what kind of motion, what kind of feeling are they putting into it? And that's what that's what I'm going to play is something that's going to relate to it. If they if they're playing something really you know sassy at me, I'm going to sassy back to them. You know, yeah. if they're going to play something, oh, da -da 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 -da, it's like I might play something sassy to reply back to them. So it's kind of almost like a conversation going on. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. So that that's <clears throat> that's what I learned to play in jazz. Yeah. You know, we you you play well. Yeah, it's like you know, it's listen to Miles Davis. He he plays great, uh, a great trumpet in that area. You know, he'll play really low and this that and smooth and this and also and he'll just start going up 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 up. You know, start start making remarks like he's talking. And then, mm -hmm. then we'll go into other areas. And uh, that's fun. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it's uh, the conversation piece is really important because in improvisation, one of the things that helped me most was when I forget who told me this, but they essentially just said, sell it. Even if you make a wrong note, sell it. Nobody's going to know or the, they'll think that you're being an artist or whatever. And so, you know, just just don't stop. Keep just sell it and be confident. And then, you know, it, that's that's helped me in life, too, because it's like sometimes it's like that whole fake it to make it ethos. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't really know what I'm doing yet. But if I say it confidently enough, then people kind of like, wait, is this this? I mean, it sounds like he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then he's eventually you do know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So that's... Yeah, that, was, uh, that was a big part of, uh, you know, solos and stuff. When I played the trumpet, is like, just to do it. Just do it. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you mess up or not. They won't know. <laughs> yeah. Play something, make it sound good, and make it, and make it, relating to what the piece is it's totally. like uh, i played i played hello dolly and uh who's that big solo in hello dolly for me okay. and, and the guy introduced me because we you know we don't have lewis arms we don't have S satchmo or lewis armstrong here but we do have the cambridge and and so they started playing and next thing you know i'm playing and it's like oh shit i'm not playing i'm not playing the right write notes but it sounded good so i just kept on playing and everybody loved it it's like it wasn't supposed it wasn't supposed to be like that yeah but you sold, i sold it mm -hmm. of course i had my my, my uh, snazzy shirt on you know my, my blue shirt, shirt. <laughs> you know yeah. i had to play the part <laughs> yeah yeah no i think that's really important so this this gets to uh question I like asking a lot because one of the things people like there's various reasons to start playing an instrument but to perform is very anxiety uh ridden for a lot of people so what do you first of all what are some of the like really terrible experiences that you've had on stage and then how have you overcome those as a musician to continue performing well, my worst experience in my life was down there at that, uh, that, uh, I don't know, that contest down in Oregon. Mm. You know, opening up, 
I open it up and I'm sitting there terrified in front of these judges with all this solo. And it's like, I was, I was literally terrified and I started playing and I was terrified when I was playing. It, it showed. And it, 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 it scared me. You know, I don't know if scared me, but I just knew at that point in time, I wasn't going to be a professional player. But yet, on the other hand, I loved playing. So, mm -hmm. so next time I got up, I, I just played best I could play. Yeah. And, but yeah, that was the uh, most terrifying moment in my life playing trumpet. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, I mean, it's frightening to get up there and play by yourself. That's, and even if, like you're saying, trumpet, you're right. It's very, like, in your face. It's loud. It's, we want the spotlight. So playing trumpet, in a jazz band, you still get a lot of spotlight, even though there's a bunch of other musicians playing. But there's a lot of other performance opportunities where being second chair trumpet or fourth or fifth or sixth chair trumpet with a whole bunch of other instrument sections playing around you where it's like, okay, I can perform and, and start build, or playing in a small setting with just a few people and building up to bigger and bigger audiences. These are ways to really practice uh, getting, overcoming that anxiety and really what I do is channel the anxiety into the expression that I'm able to have from moment to moment in my experiences. But uh, what do you think about that? I think it's great. I, uh, I agree with you on that person can do it and it takes time. <laughs> I don't care whatever there, there's, when you go go to perform and I haven't performed in front of people for years, uh, but I always remember the anxiety the excitement and the fun. It's like, I got to walk through this. I have to do it because I know it's going to be good. But it scares the living crud out of you. <laughs> yeah. It really does. It's like you're sitting there going, all these people, all these people are going to be watching, they're going to hear, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, you know, and you're sitting there, and then all of a sudden you start doing it. It's like, oh, this is great. I love mm -hmm. it. And next thing you know, you're just doing it. Yeah. Well, so what advice would you give to someone just starting their journey as a practicing musician? Practice, 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 and have fun. Have fun. That's the biggest thing. Enjoy yeah. it. And uh, you'll find out that you can go in your own little world, at least I could. I'll grab my trumpet or my flugel horn, and I could just go in my own little world and just disappear for an hour, two hours, mm -hmm. and just, just play and have fun. Yeah. Yeah, Next. I mean, we got, we got our practice, practice, practice. Yep. Yeah. That's the key. And you don't think it's practice? Once, once you start having fun doing it, I never thought of it as practice. I always thought of it as this is fun to do. Oh, you know, just like goodness. you know, a lot of people. Oh, I'm taking up the hobby of golf. Well, yeah. you got to practice, 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 and be good. Well, why do you practice? Well, because you enjoy it. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it isn't like oh, you got to play this. That, 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 I'm no good at. That. No, you practice. You get better. When you get better, it gets funner and funner. And the better you get, the funner it is. Oh, totally. That's. I mean. People don't realize this, but you can go to school as long as you want to become a doctor, do all the PhD and all the two to nine years of residency. And then what do you do? You go and you practice medicine. And what do you do if you become a lawyer, you get your JD, you go and you have your practice. Yep. That's what you do. <laughs> That's not your practice. Why should you <laughs> not to? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nobody really knows what they're doing. You know, there's people that have a better idea of what they're doing than others. And, uh, but it's the same thing. I mean, even if I, I, cause I grew up in a family of doctors, I use a lot of medical terminology when describing musical processes. And from a, a medical perspective, what they're doing is diagnosing, which is a Greek etymological root of gnosis which actually is kind of heretical in christianity but gnosis literally just means knowledge through spiritual experience that's the literal translation and uh 
So dia means through way of. So when you're diagnosing something, you're you're going through knowledge of spiritual experience to be able to tell somebody what the issue is. And this is what I do when I'm playing music. The more experience that you have through your practice, then the more that you can diagnose from moment to moment what remedy, what minor spatial change you need to make, what minor thought you need to remove or or focus on in order to be more present. Um, I mean, I could talk about this, the spiritual nature of so, the music for a long time, but. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. So you're saying more, more you do it, the more you realize you're more in tune with it. So does that make you want to do it more and enjoy it more? Yes, it does. And this is the paradox of freedom because people say, oh, well, that person spends all their time doing this one thing. And what they don't realize is that that one thing is expanding in their consciousness. So they are becoming more and more free within their discipline or their art form. Whereas there's the, the paradox is I want to have more freedom to do more of what I want, but then you get less and less proficient. You, you can, you, it's because we are time bound sentient beings, we can become less proficient at each thing that we do, the more things that we want to do. So we got to choose. And there's a large spectrum of what, where you want to be in every place, but do I want to focus my attention on becoming more free in this discipline? Or do I want to focus my attention on becoming more free in, in diverse experiences that are multidisciplinary? And, you know, so that's that's kind of the, the paradox everybody has to live with and choose from. And that's definitely not taught in schools, which is why <laughs> I'm so passionate about doing what I'm doing. The big thing is you got to enjoy it. You know, people go, well, I want to learn how to do I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. Question is, do you really enjoy it? Is it worth it? Is it worth yeah. putting effort into it? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as I got older, I found out I found out a lot of things in life. You know, I don't I don't snow ski like I used to. I don't water ski much. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't do a lot of outside sports like I yeah. used to because I focus more on the things that I get more enjoyment out of. Yeah, and 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 it seems like the more I focus on those things the more enjoyment I get out of it. Well, it's, it's totally, that's true. And even from the perspective of looking at a master gardener or like a, a Zen master with his bonsai tree, those mm -hmm. things live a long time. They're super tiny. And what they're doing is they're trimming off these little tiny dead parts so that then the rest of it can have more life. And that's what you do with uh, growing any fruit or vegetable. You have to trim off the dead leaves so that mm -hmm. then the energy isn't going into fruitless efforts right. it's putting all its energy into the actual fruit that then you can reap yourself and so that's uh so i i mean i personally have chosen the path of get, diving very deep into a few things um but there's a lot of people that that see that as a prison and uh you know it's just it's it's that transcendental realization of the paradox and then that's what sets you free really in my opinion so yeah it's cool so dave uh we got uh, just a minute left here um i really want to thank you for coming on the podcast uh and talking about your experience both in music uh be why you got involved with practicing musician what you like uh, how music relates to other things that you've done in your life such as technology and uh cars and and different different things that we've discussed um is there anything you'd like to say to close out the podcast today well thanks for having me uh you know i, I just know that rhythm and sound and music is a part of life mm -hmm. the more you open your mind up to it the more you're going to enjoy life as it is because there's sound and music coming from everything. Like we talked about cars going by, birds singing, machinery going this way. Uh, and there's music in everything that goes. Everything has a rhythm to it in life. And, uh, you know, music is the way we express express our emotions a lot of times. Or yeah. Our emotions sometimes. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. And I'd love to have you come back sometime. We'll talk more about this uh, 
And I really have enjoyed working with you and look forward to what we're going to be creating together so that more people can access music. So thank you for being on our team and, uh, and coming and talking with me today. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye. There we go.